Okay, so today our Talk to the Animals is a day in the life of field services presented by Harold Hahn. Um, who is Harold? Harold Hahn is our Senior Manager of Field Services, Disaster Response and Facilities. So he is a very busy man doing a lot of great things for our organization. Um, we are extremely lucky to have him and his leadership. He has a bachelor's degree in business administration. He has 15 years in law enforcement, over 30 years of investigative experience, um, over 12 years in retail operations, asset protection, safety, and security. Um, I feel like Harold knows everyone as well, and he always <laughs> knows someone um, in different areas, so it's really cool to see um, all of his years of experience in different things. Um, I think, too, you know, he has obviously a love for animals. That's why he's here. And Harold uh, grew up with horses and cattle and prawn ponds and punaloo. And you can see in these very cute pictures that he willingly shared with us um, is Harold back in the day. <laughs> so um, I'm going to unmute Harold right now if I can. And I will mute myself. So Harold can take it away. All right, can you hear, can you hear me, Christina? All right, thanks. Well, once again, thank you everyone for joining us this evening and spending some time with us. The volunteer services group, Christina and Sam, you know, created this awesome presentation. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna think you're gonna learn a lot and enjoy. So let's get started with our first slide. So a little bit of our field services history. We were formed in 1883 as a Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals and Children. Um, then in 1897, we started uh, a partnership with our police and our the first deputized officer was Helen Kinal Wilder. And she focused mostly on um, working animals, not pet animals back then. And her first Paniolo or Deputy officer was Chang Apana, and that's the real life Charlie Chan from the TV series. Um, in 1900, there were 849 cases of animal cruelty, including 285 horses and mules that were overworked. In 1927, guess what? Our city authorizes two dog catchers at $4.50 salary for both. So we've come a long, long way since, since then. Um, in 1935, um, the child protection functions were transitioned to the newly formed Children's Services Association. So that's kind of a brief history. I mean, I think we're one of the oldest animal welfare groups in the country. Um, I believe one in New York, maybe the same age or just a little bit older. So very, very rich history. Next slide. All right, field services today. Our officers specialize in animal law enforcement and criminal justice. Um, we're the only authority outside of the Honolulu Police Department that can um, rescue animals and investigate cruelty on behalf of the city and county of Honolulu. So we have a contract with our city. Um, we walk a fine line between education, um, advocacy, and enforcement using outreach an outreach-based approach for animal welfare. And this is very important and critical to our jobs is that we're front facing, a front-facing department that is based heavily on education and outreach to achieve the desired results. All right, next slide. You know, just, just to give you an idea, pet ownership on Oahu, which I think is very important. I teach this to the police recruits as well. 58% um, of our households have pets. 44% of Oahu households have dogs. 18% have cats, 17% have other pets. Estimated dogs in Oahu, about 279,000 dogs. Estimated owned cats is about 163,000. This does not include free roaming cats. So right now I think our CR department is working on a cat count um, to see if we can estimate the amount of free roaming cats we have. But right now we really don't know how many cats are out there. And I think this is critical because when you look at this as a whole, this kind of guides what kind of services we provide, where we deploy those services, and how we strategically plan for the future, like West Oahu, our West Oahu campus. All right, next slide. 
dispatch. Those are our call takers. Um, let's go over a brief overview of what they do. Um, I think. Next slide. So our scope of work at our dispatchers, we have four dispatchers um, that take calls from seven, oh, 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. 24 seven. They take more than 6,000 calls for help a year. Uh, they work hand in hand with the humane investigators. Their job is to get as much information and transfer that to the humane investigators so that they can do their jobs. Um, in addition, they utilize education because a lot of the calls they get, people want to talk to somebody. And so they get calls and answer questions about all the work we do. Okay, spay neuter clinic, adoptions, admissions, appointments. So they're educating, you know, they're, they, could, they could be on a 20 minute call. I can hear them daily educating the public on free roaming cats, trap neuter release, and they really take and do a great job of educating over the phone. They also assist and really um, drive our lost and found reunions, which helps animals um, get reunited with their families. Okay, next slide. So coming up, we have Christelle Carcamo. Um, she started as a humane investigator in Maui, transitioned as a humane investigator here, and now transitioned over to our dispatch. Um, and she has some stories about a day in the life of dispatch. So take it away, Christelle. I'm Christelle with the field service department, um, currently a dispatcher. Um, so a day in the life of a dispatcher would be answering calls basically um i would say a lot of the calls we get would still be in regards to barking dogs which now is hpd um a lot of questions about what's the definition in the laws regarding neglect and cruelty and how we define them um, so we explain to people what the letter of the law states what they see is wrong and will it let them know if there's a violation or not. If there is, then we'll generate a case. We'll put it in uh, two different folders. If it's the east or the west, we'll put it in there. And then an the officer will be assigned a case to go out. Um, yeah, that I would say that would be a lot of our calls. Um, and then as regards to lost, we also handle lost and found department. Um, so a lot of those are us following up with um, stray animals that come into us or found reports, seeing if there's possible matches, um, trying to make appointments for people to come in or letting them know that, hey, your animal is here um, and to come and reclaim. So I would say that's a day in the life of a dispatcher. All right. Let's proceed to the next slide, which would be Sheldon Mao, a dispatcher. Um, and he has, you know, we, we come across stories that are funny, tragic, um, you know, very tear jerking. But he has a, a, a great story to share about a real case that we were that we were assigned to and our officers responded to. Um, hi, I'm Sheldon. Uh, I've been a dispatcher here at the Hawaiian Humane Society for uh, five years plus now. Um, uh, I was asked what is one of my more memorable stories. Uh, I'm gonna apologize to Vern already in advance with this call. Um, so I got a call about koi fish in a pond in about two inches of water that were drowning or dying. So obviously that's an emergency call right away. Uh, Vern was the nearest, or Officer Ling was the nearest officer in the area. So I dispatched him to that call. When he arrived on scene, Hawaii Five-O was filming at the time, so he had to interrupt the filming of that show, and then he went in and checked on the fish. The fish were, um, I guess you could say fine, because they were all ceramic fish in a fountain that was being drained. So yes, they were in two inches of water, yes, there were fish there, but they were ceramic. So, but thanks Vern for, or Officer Ling for going out and stopping Hawaii Five-O to make sure these fish are all right. <laughs> Thanks, Sheldon. That was great. And it's, you know, I hear them 
on the phone all day long. And I, I wish I took notes because we could probably write a book or memoirs or something about dispatch stories. But anyway, um, let's proceed on to our humane investigators in the next slide. All right. So our scope of work. Right now we have eight humane investigators. Um, I just realized that two of them are working overnight from 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. in the morning. So they take emergency calls and watch our campus overnight. So from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. daily, we only have six humane investigators on the road, 24-7, 365, handling more than 7,000 calls or cases and driving 130,000 miles total, um, you know, as an average, you know, 915 cruelty cases um, and abandoned reports were filed last year. And it's a really a balance and of education and enforcement. And, you know, it's, it requires patience. It requires being non-judgmental. Um, a lot of us in animal welfare are, myself included, are very quick to judge people, but in order to get results, you have to really remain non-judgmental and really balance education and enforcement. Um, so it's a big scope of work. It's, it's almost like being a social worker, a police officer, um, an outreach worker, a teacher, all rolled into one. So it's a, it's a very dynamic job. Um, next slide. All right, so let's join Officer Nakagami. He's been with us, oh geez, almost 10 years now, I wanna say. And he has a story regarding a rescue that's very personal for him. Uh, my name is Kevin Nakagami. I'm with the Field Services Department. I am a humane investigator. Been doing this for about nine years. Uh, so one of the calls that I got one time was an animal cruelty call. Uh, that I was assigned in Waianae for a emaciated dog. So went there, saw the dog, dog was clearly emaciated, see all the um, rib bone showing, the hip bone showing, he was very, very emaciated. Um, so I talked to the owner, asked, told them, hey, you know, your dog is clearly in need of veterinary care and needs to be taken to a vet. Um, they said that they couldn't afford it at that time, so they, surrender the dog to Hawaiian Humane Society. Um, I saw other dogs on the property um, and they were fine. They looked perfectly healthy. It was just this one that needed some medical attention. Um, so I gave them a written warning uh, in the future that in case this does happen again, that the dog needs to go to a veterinary vet for care. So I ended up taking the dog in. Um, dog is in our custody, had the vets take a look at him. Uh, over that time, maybe the course of a couple days, I actually took the dog out and uh, was playing with him uh, in the dog park. Kind of generally, I don't try to do that because, you know, in our line of work, we get kind of attached to everything that we that we encounter. But in this instance, I just felt some kind of like attachment to this dog. So I kept on watching him for a couple days, um, going through the process, through the shelter, seeing what the doc said. and. The docs determined that through, due to his uh, weakened state that he may not um, he may not survive the heartworm treatment, which, which what he had, positive heartworm and all other kind of worms in him. But I told the docs that, you know, I wanted to take that chance, and, which they gave me. So I ended up adopting him. They gave him the treatment. Um, I believe he was about 30 pounds when I impounded him or when I took him in. And when he got fully rehabbed, he's about 80 pounds now and super happy. Sorry, his video just cuts off a little bit like that, but that's the end. <laughs> okay, next slide. And there's Kevin and... Oh. Very happy story. Very happy dog. All right. Um, next slide. I think we're going to transition to another cruelty case. I think uh, Johnny Cash and Officer Ling will be, and some other people will be um, sharing this story with you. 
We got a call uh, through my shift that we had a cat over at O Triple C that was in distress. Uh, caller apparently was walking past there, saw the cat meowing out loud. So stopped to kind of see what was going on. So calls it into the Hawaiian Humane Society with a distress call saying there's a cat stuck within the barbed wire of the prison. So the first thing that comes to mind is we need to get there right away. So we get there and then we actually see and make an assessment of what was really going on. It, it all just comes down to reaction. Time is an essence. We really need to act fast. We really need to get this cat help. This cat is in danger. We really need to get this cat to safety right away. So how are we going to do it? And what course of action are we going to take to get this cat out? I had to make a, a urgent decision to contact our veterinarian staff at the shelter. It was my day off. I got a call and I thought we really need to help this cat. The first thing going through our mind is we, we need to get this cat freed as soon as possible. We don't, I don't know what the health issues are with this cat. I don't know how long this cat actually was even there. I just know that we needed to get this cat freed. The cat was stuck in barbed wire and when it was unable to get out. So I made the decision that we would send our veterinary services team to the site and sedate the cat so that we could extract from the barbed wire. We drove down to O Triple C, and of course it was raining that day. So that didn't make the situation any much e any more easier. When we looked down, we saw this what looked like a very just devastated long-haired cat completely wrapped in barb razor wire uh, the tail was just completely had coiled around the razor the cat was meowing at us immediately we kind of looked at each other and we were like wow we have a situation here I think at that point, Johnny was pretty much defeated. So he was just staying still. We just, we knew right away. There was no way that one, we could get to the cat without hurting ourselves because now we're dealing with, not only is the cat trapped, you know, in the razor barbed wire, but there's a fence between us, the cat, and then a, another fence behind it, right? Cause this is, this is, this is a jailhouse we're talking about. And two, how are we gonna untangle this cat from barbed wire? And cats are very sporadic, you know? We don't know at this point if it's a friendly cat or not. So I think for the sake of not only Johnny's safety, but everyone else involved, we needed to sedate the cat. Once we sedated Johnny, it kind of then became a balancing game. It, it took three people. So you have the fence line, you have the officer who was on the other side of the fence line. She now is, um, she's covered herself. She's put a lot of layers of clothes on. She has gloves on. She has, you know, protection gear on. Me and the technician are on the other side of that fence. One of us is, you know, keeping an eye on the vitals, making sure that Johnny is still breathing, making sure Johnny still is, is blinking and is responsive to us as he is being sedated. While the other one of us is literally with two poles that we kind of had to MacGyver, trying to balance the cat from falling uh, further down and deeper into these razors. So it was really a team effort and it took all three of us to safely get Johnny out of the situation without causing more harm to, to his body. Once the cat was free, we were able to rush it back to the Humane Society for further treatment with our veterinarians there. Initially, when Johnny Cash came in, he was waking up from anesthesia still, but uh, we saw that eventually, once he was awake from anesthesia, he was stable. He had a severe tail injury and had a couple of scrapes. He was microchipped. So he was on an owner hold. I contacted the microchip owner and explained the situation to him. I explained that the cat needed medical attention 
and surgery. So after talking to the owner, he decided to relinquish care to us. So then at that point, we were able to do surgery. So the surgery for Johnny Cash was a tail amputation, was the main surgery. His tail was broken about halfway down, so it was cold to the touch, it was limp. This cat was found outside of OCCC, trapped in the barbed wire. So I was trying to think of a name fitting for that. So I thought of Johnny Cash's Folsom Prison concert um, and went, went with Johnny Cash for his name. Johnny's recovery was really smooth. He recovered pretty quickly. He was out on the adoptions floor within days after the surgery and went up for adoption quickly. Our COVID-19 emergency foster care program was created during our first COVID county shutdown. We were able to place approximately 380 animals into our program um, during the first three months. We decided to enact this program to reduce the amount of animals that we had here in our shelter and also open up more potential space during the unprecedented times. My name is Yuhyan Zhang. Uh, I live in Kaimuki with my roommate Claire Caulfield. And uh, when the pandemic really hit the fan um, and we had to quarantine together, we just really wanted an animal companion. When Yuhyan and I were talking about, wow, we're going to be trapped in this house together for what we thought was just going to be a few weeks, um, we thought that having an animal around would be really fun and really great and something we could do for the communities and do for ourselves. And so that's what inspired us to foster. Claire and I were talking amongst ourselves. We don't want a cat that we want. We want a cat that needs us. We wanted to care for a pet that needed loving. So when we first got Johnny Cash, who we later named Tom, um, he was so scared and so, so fearful. Just the slightest noise would make him jump. And you could tell that something really bad had happened to this cat and that really made us want to love him and make him feel safe even more. We noticed little things about him right away. Like he had a chipped ear, like his left paw was a little bit mangled for the lack of a better word. He, his tail is chopped. And I was like, this cat's been through some stuff. And like, we both could like really identify with that. And I think within days, we knew that this cat wasn't going anywhere. It just is such a transformation. It feels like that little scared skinny cat that, that came home with us in April is just an entirely new, new cat, new personality. Um, it's so fun to see his personality come out, see his little quirks. Um, he now has complete control of the house. We now live in Tommy's house. Tommy yeah. does <laughs> in our house. Tommy, we're his butlers. And we wouldn't want it any other way. I just, I love this cat so much. Finding the perfect home for Johnny Cash is very heartwarming. Um, being able to find the perfect adopters and seeing him overcome his injuries and blossom into the nice young cat that he is, is very rewarding. Seeing his follow-up stories and his happy photos of him living his best life at home definitely warms the heart of the team. My 18 years of experiences here is all about saving lives and we are actually the voice for all animals who are helpless out there and need us. The word home to me means a safe place and to be able to provide that safe place 
to Tom means a great deal to me and to Claire. We're going to continue to provide that safe place, that home to him, as long as we're able. All right, so um, next I wanna just cover um, what animal cruelty is and share with you some of our cruelty cases and give you examples so you really can see. Um, as you saw in the last video, any animal rescue or cruelty case um, that we take on is really a partnership of our entire organization coming you know, from the officers, the dispatchers, the officers, our veterinary staff, admissions, adoptions, foster, um, all the way through. It's just a, a, a great team effort. So that I really have to stress that. And our volunteers play a big role in helping us uh, you know, support us in these types of cases as well um, with animal care, fostering, um, enrichment, anything like that. So it's a really, it's a, it, it, it truly is a total team effort. And our team works so well under these um, very difficult circumstances. So I wanna thank our entire organization. All right, so next slide, let's start off with what cruelty in the first degree is. So these are all state of Hawaii laws, Hawaii revised statutes. So animal, every law has a state of mind attached to it. Um, and that's the state of mind that we have to prove in order to convict somebody of any crime. Uh, so cruelty in the first degree, it's really important. State of mind has to be intentionally or knowingly, all right, um, perform animal cruelty. Kills, tortures, mutilates, or poisons causing the death or serious bodily injury of an animal. All right? Kills or attempts to kill any pet animal. And cruelty in the first degree is a felony. All right? So, um, you know, we're going to be talking about uh, cruelty in the first degree, cruelty in the second degree. But just so you know, every criminal law that we have has a state of mind attached to it that as an officer or as a law enforcement organization, we need to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that state of mind before a successful prosecution can occur. All right, um, next slide. Cruelty in the second degree, intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly. All right, that's the state of mind of the, of the subject. Overdrives, overloads, tortures, torments, beats, causing substantial bodily injury, or starves a pet animal. So um, substantial serious bodily injury would be like close to death bodily injury. Substantial would be, you know, anything less than that, but not a minor injury. Um, and then also failure to provide necessary sustenance or causes such deprivation. The third bullet point, necessary sustenance, is the most common cruelty call or report we get and the most common investigation we um we perform, okay? Failing to provide necessary sustenance. And the next slide will tell you what that is under the law. Necessary sustenance. Care sufficient to preserve the health and well-being of a pet animal, except for emergencies or circumstances beyond the reasonable control of the owner or caretaker of that animal. It includes, but is not limited to the following requirements. Adequate food, to allow for normal growth and weight maintenance, quality water, area of confinement, which is not too small for the animal. And I'll, I'll share some examples. And then an area of confinement or kenneling, which is free from feces and urine. So clean throughout the day, in other words, all right? Next slide. Here's a case animal that was not provided necessary sustenance of food. So as you can see, the dog came in. That's probably a, you know, we have a rating scale, um, I'll call it a body conditioning score. That dog as on the left would probably be a one or a two, which is definitely not healthy. And then about three or four months later, that dog is up to a four or five where the dog should be. All right. So there's two ends of the spectrum. There's too thin and then there's also overweight. But a body score of a four of a five, four or five is perfect for um, any animal, particularly a dog. All right. 
Next slide. Let's do a case study with Cheddar. So many of you know um, James Montgomery or his name. Um, in 2006, before I started, I started in 2015, he was charged with animal cruelty of over 100 animals, dogs specifically, um, living in horrible conditions. And back in 2006, he was charged with animal cruelty in the second degree, which is a misdemeanor. But back in 2006, there was no felony provision for that. Um, he subsequently pleaded no contest, which under the law, anybody charged with a crime can plead not guilty, guilty, or no contest. If you do not have a previous criminal record and you plead no contest, you probably won't see any jail time. And if you are free and clear of a probationary period, that record will be expunged from your, I mean, that criminal offense will be expunged from your record. So James Montgomery back in 2006 pleaded no contest, did his five years probation. Fast forward to 2016, we received a call from his daughter who also lived at his residence saying Mr. Montgomery threw two deceased dogs away in his trash can fronting his address. So I was on the mainland at a cruelty seminar over the over like four days so I wasn't here so our officers responded and the trash can was out at the end of the driveway so we have to follow fourth amendment constitutional law so a closed trash container even if it's on a public sidewalk getting ready to get picked up by the trash cannot be opened without a search warrant okay or or probable cause so his daughter called it in and said two deceased animals were in this trash can. She happened to be there with another tenant who that was their trash can. They opened it voluntarily for us. Inside, we found cheddar, dog barely hanging on to life right there. So this was all good. No Fourth Amendment constitutional law violations. We didn't open the trash can. They reported it. They witnessed it. They opened the trash can themselves and showed us. Under cheddar in that plastic bag was a deceased larger dog. Our officers went in um, under the direction of HPD, who kind of led them astray a little bit, violated some constitutional rights, and went further into the property without a warrant and found a bunch of other dogs. Um, at that point, they backed out and said, no, we need a warrant, because there were dogs barking in the backyard. And if they got a search warrant, it was served at night, Next slide, please. And they found a bunker. So in 2006, when James Montgomery was arrested, you see that tile wall with the little diamonds on it? That was all not enclosed. It was wide open and dogs living in filthy conditions in kennels. It was a puppy mill. What he did was after his five years of probation, he enclosed that entire wall with a concrete bunker with just one way in and out. And in that bunker was the animals you see on the right. In the dark, feces and urine, crammed into cages, horrible, 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 horrible. Okay, so over 30 dogs were rescued out of this bunker. Um, Mr. Montgomery was charged because they went onto that property a little too far, um, all the cases, all the case dogs after Cheddar, all those charges were thrown out. He was charged with a felony for Cheddar, though. So you can see how it can get really complicated with search and seizure, knowing the law and what we can and cannot do. So next slide. And that's Cheddar, I think about one year after um, he was rescued. And Mr. Montgomery was convicted, subsequently served his jail time. Um, one of the longer um, convictions I've seen, he spent a year in jail um, and he's, he's out now with adult probations. So, you know, really important, our officers need to understand constitutional law. They need to follow all the correct steps. Um, and, you know, I always like to say, it's not what you know or what someone tells you, it's what you can prove. So we have to kind of go by that, that mantra of be, we have to be able to prove everything beyond a reasonable doubt to get convictions. All right, next 
slide, another case study, Mr. Ghali, who just got adopted. So Ghali uh, was with us for our second degree cruelty case um, in October of 2020. Um, his owner um, was witnessed beating him severely till he couldn't get up. Um, panting, exhausted. Gali's an elder dog, probably about 10 years or a little over 10 years old. Um, police arrived, arrested the owner for animal cruelty. He was extremely overweight, um, suffered from other medical issues, um, but nothing really serious happened to him in terms of the, the beating or injuries. So he was put into the foster care program um, while the case was being investigated. And there's a provision of the law in the cruelty law that says we can petition the court or the judge for forfeiture prior to a criminal trial, which was what we did in this case. Our attorney filed for forfeiture. Forfeiture was granted um, one year later and he was adopted. I think, uh, I wanna say about three weeks ago. So that's Gali's story. Next slide. I spoke a lot about this, I think, in all of my slides about outreach and education. Um, the two go so strongly hand in hand. It's what our officers do 90% of the time um, out in the field. Um, next slide. And this is how I've based our field services mission or what we've based our field services department's philosophy on um, is building rapport, right? That's our first step. Because if you can't build rapport with someone, there's no way you, you need to seek first to understand before you're understood. So that's what that building rapport process looks like. I mean, in any interaction, you know, if, if I can't seek to understand someone else first, then they're never going to even meet me halfway and understand what I'm trying to say. So building rapport is so important. Um, we educate as always a first step. You know, we ask them to make corrections. We say, hey, here's a better way of doing things. Here's what the law says. We always advocate for the animals, but we also advocate for people. A lot of this advocate work comes with dealing with a homeless population that owns animals. Okay, we got to be advocates for them. They need other city and state resources, not just for their animals, to get them out of their the situation they're in. So we we, we recommend a, a, a plethora of resources to them. That's how we advocate for people. Um, you know, recently with the eviction moratorium, um, you know, ending, we had to be advocates and um, for people that were getting evicted that had pets and couldn't take their pets with them. So you know, we did a lot to educate and offer resources. And then the very last thing we do is enforce. And when we got to enforce, we enforce. Our officers can enforce the same laws, animal laws that HPD can enforce. So really field services is built on this, this mission right here. Um, next slide. And to give an example, outreach and enforcement or outreach and education takes an extremely long time. It's not something that you can solve in two or three days. All right. So this woman, it was before I started, but um, I was I was told about her story. She lived in the Kakaako area. She had over 50 cats in these kennels living on the street. Not cruelty situations per se, but all kennel cared for. It took over two and a half years to convince her gradually, spay neuter, Hey, why don't you surrender a couple? Finally, she got down to two, but it took over two years of outreach and convincing to get this lady to do the right thing. So that's an example of balancing education and enforcement to benefit animals and the people, because I'm sure she was a lot better off with only two of her pet cats, but she still got her cats, right? As companions. So, it, you know, not an easy job, but balancing education and enforcement um, is key. And I think that's the, doing enforcement's easy because you give me a ticket book and a, and I, I can just go out and enforce, enforce, enforce. But what, what, the, the, what does that do really? That really it clogs up our court system. It not, it's not necessarily helping the animal. It's not necessarily helping the person. Enforcement is easy because it's black and white. 
it's this balancing education and being advocates and, and looking long term and what really our mission is. It's what um, our whole team does. And I think we, we base our philosophy off of that. Um, how to succeed? This is, next slide. This is what I tell my team every day. We need to be problem solvers. We need to think critically and try and find solutions. Every single person that calls us is looking for a solution. Can we help that person 100% of the time? The answer is no. Can we provide options? The answer is yes. Can we sit there and understand what they're saying and empathize with them? The answer is yes. All right. Collaboration for results. We need to be collaborators, both internally and externally with other government agencies, the community. Um, case in point, free roaming cats. We didn't create free roaming cat issues. We're not the problem solver for it. It's going to take a total collaboration, community driven and community support to solve the free roaming cat issues we are experiencing. Same with the chicken issues. It's going to take community support, right? The Humane Society is not responsible for the problem. We didn't create the problem, but the community needs to step up and find solutions. Um, we need to be experts in law enforcement and quality case development. We're always trying to improve. Let's say we go to court and we, you know, it gets dismissed or it gets dropped down. We're always partnering with the prosecutor to see what we could have done differently to ensure a quality case. All right. We need support from the prosecutors. We just had a change in regime and many of them have never handled animal cases, nor do they understand the dynamics of having animals involved in criminal cases. All right, that can domestic violence can involve the animals. So we really need to educate prosecutors and build that bond with them. Um, and we need to educate judges because for the most part, while they have law degrees and a lot of experience, they really don't understand. Very few of them, you know, unfortunately do not understand the animal component to a lot of these cases. Um, nor do they understand animal welfare as a whole, all right? And now you can listen to me stop talking and you can ask questions because I am done. Okay, guys. Um, so I don't know about you, but I have chicken skin um, every time that I see these things. Um, I also just want to thank Harold and the entire field services team for everything that they do. I, I'll be honest, I got a little choked up when we were going over the Montgomery case um, to share a little bit with you guys. Back when that case happened in 2016, I was here, but I was actually leading the communications department. Um, and I got to be a part of that case. I went into the home. I went into the bunker. I was there. We were there for like... 16 hours because we were waiting for the war and we were waiting outside and doing all this coordination and to see the team do what they do and to see the things that they see sometimes on a daily basis is it was very eye-opening for me I have been at the organization for years but being a part of that and seeing what they do um, really changed my experience here it, it's so amazing and I applaud them for doing all of that work um, for the animals um, and speaking up for them so that's my spiel. Um, let's try and look at the questions that we have. And I know Darlene had a really good one that she sent to Sam. And she was asking, how are cases handled which show clear abuse or neglect um, and the owner refuses to surrender? And I know Harold went a little bit into um, the degrees of, I guess, abuse and things like that, but I think maybe we want to learn more about when it's not so black and white and how you guys really navigate those hard situations. That's a great question. Um, it, so it's like I said, for the most part, our welfare checks or cruelty cases are like for necessary sustenance. So we educate, we follow up with them, make sure the corrections are made. But if an animal is clearly being neglected and you got to realize we also have to follow you know, you guys all watch TV and how you got to read people their rights before you talk to them. So we have to do the same thing. So it's a balance because once you see an animal that's obviously a victim of cruelty, and let's say you have witnesses or you have solid evidence, 
you have to Mirandize that pet owner or animal caretaker. They can just tell you, I'm not talking to you. I want a lawyer, right? Or we, they can cooperate us and we have to try rationalize with them. But if it's a clear case of that um, animal cruelty, we would have enough probable cause to believe that a crime was committed and the facts and circumstances to prove it. We would seize the animal or rescue the animal. We would cite the owner and issue him a court summons for animal cruelty. Um, and then we would proceed to have the animal examined. Um, sometimes we have to do necropsies, which is like an autopsy of a deceased animal. Um, you know, and then we get our attorney involved and petition for forfeiture prior to the criminal trial. And in criminal trials, you need beyond the reasonable doubt, meaning all the jury has to decide that they're guilty. In the forfeiture hearing where we get the animal forfeited, it's just a tipping of the evidence. So just a preponderance, a little more evidence to prove that in a, in a forfeiture hearing. So for the most part, animals either get surrendered or they get forfeited to us. Some of the time, the people don't want to be charged. They get charged anyway, but they end up surrendering the animals anyway. So that's either way it can go. But forfeitures take a long time. I don't know if that answered your question. Thanks, Darlene. Um, and sorry, I couldn't see the chat while the video was on my screen. And I see some people, the volume was a little soft. So I apologize. We, again, we're recording it. So we'll resend it out to everyone if you want to go back and rewatch it. Or if you want us to clarify anything you missed in the video, um, also let us know, chat it in the box, and we can do that. Um, Don had a question, Harold. How does a person become an investigator? Um, in Hawaii right now, we're trying to make it, give it some accreditation, but there really is no um, requirement. Like some states like California require you, you can't even apply for an animal services or control officer job until you go through a community college and take, I, I, I want to say it's like a semester or two semesters of, they actually have curriculum for it. So in Hawaii though, basically all we require is a, a high school diploma and you know, it's a lot of, you don't need law enforcement experience. In fact, I found that that's not really helpful. Like I said, the, the being, being able to communicate effectively with people, being empathetic with people, non-judgmental, being able to look at facts and critically think through things and walk yourself down, um, you know, some steps in investigating, that all can be taught. And really, you can't, if you err on the side of the animal, you really can't make a bad decision. You can make better decisions, but, you know, the basic, we, we do all the training here. And I think, you know, with this kind of job skill set, um, we find people from all types of backgrounds, um, as long as they have those qualities that, you know, you know, dedicated to the mission, understanding empathy and how to do that, and then communicating, um, is, is, that's kind of key to this whole job. Yeah. Um, so Josie has a question, um, and I, I, we could talk on and on about this, but she was wondering, are we, um, does the city and county subsidize um, the law enforcement work that we do here as an organization? Um, and <laughs> kind of a complicated topic, but I'm sure Harold can shed more light on um, it for you all so you guys can learn a little bit more about it is as part of our city and county contract and how that affects um, our work. And, um, but as a side note, we also for many, many, many years have been um, wanting to do everything we could for all the services that we provide that we were subsidizing out of our donor funds to do those things um, because city and county was not able to support us 100% in all of these services that we provide for the community. Um, but Harold can share more about those details. So, yeah, Christina's right. We have a city contract as the animal services provider. Um, some municipalities on the mainland have their own city animal control and animal shelters, right? Hawaii and all our islands don't. So they outsource to the, mostly the humane societies like us. So we have a contract. Most of that money though goes to actually operating our whole shelter. Cause the, and then another portion subsidizes the officers and the dispatchers. 
So we do have a contract. Um, I know Steph Kendrick is working diligently trying to get a new contract in place or a renewal. And it, it's tough because, you know, our city doesn't have funds. Our state doesn't have funds. So where's the money going to come from, right, to fund? You know, we've had to cut back on some officers. So, like I said, we used to have 12. Now we're down to eight, right? So um, it's a challenge, but, you know, we got, we're holding our own. So that's kind of state of affairs with a contract, but um, we're like a vendor for the city. And then HPD deputizes all of us, the officers. Yes. Um, and kind of piggyback on that, Jane was asking how um, our, how is Ohio Nice Study funded, which is a great question. Um, I am not an expert on all of these details, but again, we are a nonprofit. So we get funded in, in a couple ways. So one is our city and county contract, obviously, that um, for the services we provide to the community, like field services, um, we do get compensated. Most of our revenue, though, is by donors, by donations. Um, and that's all of you guys and all the great people in the community that makes up most of our funding. Um, and it's those monthly donors um, who give $10, $20 a month and don't realize that impact sometimes. They feel like, oh, it's so little bit, but it truly isn't. There is no amount that is too small. Um, that is what keeps our lights on, honestly. Um, and then we have grants as well. We, um, our development team is constantly looking for grants um, to support the work that we do and applying for them and researching for them um, and those things. And then of course we have special fundraising events like Pet Walk in Texas that also support the work that we do. So we do get funding um, in multiple ways. And if you're ever curious um, more about that, please let me know and I'm happy to um, get more information for you guys from our development team who is constantly, that's all they do um, is their full-time job is figuring out how to get enough money <laughs> into um, the organizations that we continue to do all that we do. Um, a big part of that as well, if you have any questions, is obviously our capital campaign that's happening right now for our West Oahu campus. So it's our second campus that we're building because we know that the needs are so great island-wide. The access to our services um, being in town for many is inconvenient. They don't have transportation. They don't have the means to come to us. Um, they don't have the time to come to us and get stuck in traffic for an hour and then another hour home. So we know how important it is to be out there. So that's another big thing um, funding-wise that we're working on uh, is for our capital campaign and our um, second campus. Um, Martha has a really great question, Harold. She was wondering, um, is there any way repeat offenders like James Montgomery um, can be prohibited from ever owning an animal again? Um, and also curious if other law enforcement from other states or counties um, or organizations, do we share information? How do we know if a you know, animal abuser moved from California to Hawaii? Okay, to answer the, <clears throat> that's another two good questions. Uh, to answer the first one, yeah, James Montgomery could not own animals because he got his conviction. But what he did do, he petitioned the court that he wanted to start raising fish. So they did grant him permission to raise fish. But it would take a court or judge approval for that. I don't think he's going to own dogs again, but... You never know, right? I mean, it's so easy to get animals now. He might be hoarding dogs and no one would even know, unfortunately. And the second part to that is, yes, we share information. We don't necessarily share information like, um, like a child abuser or something. If they move jurisdictions, we don't have that sort of network set up where we notify where they move to. I don't know if that's answering your question, but we do communicate. Like I will get calls from humane societies on the mainland saying, hey, we want to check on this dog that came out of Hawaii and to see if there's any dangerous dog, dog bite history or things of that nature. But yeah, we do share information. Great. Um, are there any other questions that we can answer tonight for you guys? Anything at all? Um, it was a very highly requested topic that we share more about our field services. Um, because again, they do really, really amazing work. And sometimes it's in the forefront. Sometimes a lot of it's behind the scenes that no one ever gets to see. 
Um, I think we have a few like dog walkers here with us. I, I assure many of you were really touched to see Golly featured um, in our presentation. I think a lot of people didn't realize how he came into our custody um, with um, his owner beating him. Um, and if you had a chance to meet him, you probably would have never known that because he was just the sweetest, most mellow, go with the flow dog ever. Um, he's really, really special. And we were so thrilled when the family um, adopted him and we're so excited. Um, and part of it, I think Carol too, we talked, you talked about that body scale of weight and he was extremely overweight and he spent a year in foster care. And I think he lost like 30 pounds in foster care. He had like a little bit of a, a rehab as well while he was dealing with his medical things, but they really helped him get um, into the best shape that he's probably been in for years of his life. Um, oh, so Josie has another good question. Um, and we can definitely talk more about this. I think this is a really great topic is, um, do, does Hawaii or Oahu have a problem with puppy mills? I will answer that as a yes, because I get reports all the time and I, people call me and say, hey, I bought these puppies off of Craigslist and I met the owners in a parking lot of a PetSmart and now my puppies are sick. And, you know, of course, we don't, we don't recommend meeting people in pet uh, parking lots to buy their puppies because that's what James Montgomery was doing. But yes, there are puppy mills. It's it's really hard, even though they, what it would take for a puppy mill investigation, because we don't regulate puppy mills currently. We've tried legislation before to regulate. Um, believe it or not, we get just as much opposition from legitimate breeders than we do from the puppy mill people. But um, it, it's complicated because they'll get a sick puppy and buy a sick puppy from a puppy breeder off of Craigslist, right? Um, document all that. But then they don't have any other information on the breeder because they never went to their house. The names are probably fake. Um, you know, their contact numbers don't work. So it's very hard unless we regulate it from the outset. So yes, I think it's out there because I get calls annually about this. Um, all we can do is educate people not to buy from these um, breeders that advertise on Craigslist and won't allow you to tour their home or where the animals were raised or their parents or, you know, that sort of thing. So, yes, there are puppy meals. I think we've got a lot of work to do in order. Like California, I don't even think pet shops can sell puppies unless they're documented breeders and registered and everything else. So, you know, here it's a little different. We have very, very lack of legislation on that. So something we, we, we're working, or we, it's a challenge, but we're working towards that. And Steph and her team do a great job of advocating and modifying legislation and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and we keep referring to Steph. Many of you may not know her, but and she's actually joining us tonight. But Steph Kendrick is our policy advocate. Um, she is... Hi, there she is. She does amazing work. Um, she's constantly um, working with legislative to figure out how we can better advocate for the animals um, and the people that support animals and all of those things. And it's endless work to do that um, because we, we have a long way to go in Hawaii. Um, you know, Harold definitely touched on all of those puppy mill things. And what I would love to share and one thing that I would love for all of us to walk away from tonight is knowing that all of us right here um, have the power to help that problem. And really that's by educating everyone you know when they're interested in getting a new pet to join their family. Um, adoption obviously is the number one choice that we like because we have so, so, so many animals here um, looking for homes. Um, but it's also on the flip side of educating them on why maybe a pet store isn't the best option. Because again, as you've learned from Harold, there's no regulation on that. So the dogs, um, mostly dogs that are sold in pet stores, there's no regulation on what condition those puppies were born in, who the parents are, how are they cared for, what is the environment, how responsible those breeders are. They have no background on it most of the time. And these puppies are sold for thousands and thousands of dollars um, and are 
clearly just for profit. Um, so, you know, and that's why we were so thrilled when Petco and PetSmart came to the island. They do not sell cats and dogs. They partner with shelters to adopt out, um, something they're very passionate about. Um, and we, here I'll kind of touch on it, but responsible breeders, we are not fully opposed to getting from a breeder. There are some really responsible breeders out there who um, advocate for animals just as much as we do to make sure that they are um, advancing the bloodlines or however you want to say it um, in a very responsible way that is in respect to the breed. So what do you look for when looking for a responsible breeder? I think is a great question and things you can also share with people. A responsible breeder will always let you come see where the puppies and the parents are living in and born and how they're raised. Um, they'll share their information with you. Um, a lot of times they should have already gone to a vet and should have some vet records to share with you. So ask questions, um, especially if you're on Craigslist or Facebook market or wherever you are and you see um, an animal for sale. I mean, ask those questions because that is the best way to know. Um, and the more that we can support those types of avenues to get animals, obviously, hopefully less puppy mills and backyard breeders um, will be able to operate because it will be not as much of a demand um, for that. Steph, did you want to share anything with um, in the works or anything? Sorry to put you on the spot. Oh, uh, let me unmute you. Thanks, Christina. Um, no, I just, and I, I see a lot of my advocates on here. Hi, guys. Um, but I just, you know, Harold did such a wonderful job. I wish there were a hundred people on this zoom right now. Um, but I'm glad that the 25 who are here are here. Uh, the work that field services does is amazing to me every day. And Harold and I are working together on a couple of city initiatives, um, that should further improve things for our animals. Um, and we'll be looping you guys in on that as soon as they're, we're ready to actually start talking to our lawmakers about it. But you know, it's, as Christina said, the work just never stops, but um, I'm so proud of Harold and his team and the work that they do every day with the laws that we have, and we'll keep trying to make them better. <laughs> Thank you, Steph. Um, so I don't have any more questions that I see. Um, so I, Jamie, I, I do see your question about how we work with other shelters um, and depending on the different kinds that they are. And Harold, you might be able to speak a little bit more into this and how we create partnerships with other organizations. But um, it is something that we are prioritizing a lot is working with other organizations. And what goes into that though, is also making sure that we align together on both sides and our philosophy on what is the best way to help the animals. Um, as all of you know, we are an open admission shelter. So we are taking in thousands and thousands and thousands of animals, um, and we don't turn them away um, for companion animals. So we get aggressive and we get friendly and we get healthy and we get sick. So we have to make those determinations of what is best for the animal. Um, and so we really look for other organizations who can understand that that is who we are as an organization and can work with us and support us and also align in that mission. Um, Harold, I don't know if you know how we kind of select some of the organizations we partner with. I think, I mean, any of you that have been here longer than, or, or 2015, since 2015 know that we never used to partner with organizations before. And I think um, we, since Anna's came aboard, we made it a point to be very transparent, try to get together with other rescue organizations, um, try and come to that. Like I said, that collaboration takes, it's a two way street, right? You gotta be able to find common ground in order to work together. And I think we are making progress, but it, it takes a lot of transparency on both ends, right? So yes, there are rescue organizations out there that aren't too reputable. And there's some that we really wanna partner with. Just to give you an example, I don't, I don't know if you know, but our dispatchers take calls about loose dogs in neighborhoods all day long, right? We don't have the staff to go out there unless the animal is contained. But part of the new way of thinking is getting other organizations 
to partner with you to deploy dog traps, communicate with the community. Hey, we're trying to rescue this dog in your neighborhood. Don't feed it. But it's heavily relied with volunteers and other organizations. And I just was on a call where they had instituted a great program like that. So I think it's something we want to do. It's just that we got to tread lightly and proceed cautiously with everyone we deal with because eventually it's a reflection of what we do and we got to make sure we're aligned and we're supporting each other because what we don't want is to get involved with an organization and then have us take the brunt of some heavy criticism for no reason right so it's a lot of trust involved and trust doesn't happen overnight but we're making progress in that area and that's i know that's happening so yeah yeah great questions um well, if there are no other questions, um, I think we can all wrap it up for the night. But thank you guys so much again for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time to do this. We love doing the talk to the animals. Um, we will have one another uh, next quarter. We'll announce that topic very soon. We're very excited for it. Um, hopefully it will be in person. That is our plan and our hope. So we will all get to see you guys um, all together and you guys can see each other too outside of your screen. Um, if you guys have any other questions, always feel free to email me or Sam. We can always forward it off and get um, answers from Harold if it doesn't relate to us and we can get you the answers. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much again for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Have a good rest of your evening. Um, yeah, bye guys.